Good evening, everybody. And it's a pleasure to be with you. And usually we give the Shabbos Shuvah Drosha. Why do we give the Shabbos Shuvah Drosha? In Shul. But I am in Shul, but I'm not in the sanctuary. I'm not in the base Knesses. I'm in my office. Why? Because we are still in the throes of the COVID-19 pandemic. We're still uh, sheltering at home. Some of us isolating. And it's not quite as it should be yet. And we're davening. We started the davening on Rosh Hashanah. And we're continuing to, davening on Yom, uh, to daven on Yom Kippur. That this year we're going to see a Yeshua Keheref Ayin. We're going to see a salvation like the blink of an eye. That everything is going to turn me'afela le'oira from darkness to light. Mishibud li'geula, literally. From incarceration to liberation. And that we should see the back of this horrible pandemic. We should no longer be incarcerated at home. But we should have a geula shalema and a refua shalema. Not a half a hearted Yeshua and not a half-hearted refuah, but the full thing and that we should be able to come back to our shul and be able to hear droshes from the rabbi on Shabbos. Of course, only those who want to hear droshes. Some people don't want to hear droshes from the rabbi, not on Shabbos and not during the week. In any event, we are delighted for Shabbos Shuvah and in, in anticipation of Shabbos Shuvah to be able to share some Torah with you and that's what I'd like to do. But we are commemorating this year is in commem commemoration of and in memory of uh, Anna Markheim Silberspitz and uh, it's Cecile Gromis's mother it's the first anniversary of her passing it's her yard site she was born in 1923 she died in 2019 exactly a year ago her name in Hebrew was Chana Bas Shimon Alecha Sholem the Neshama should have an Aliyah we should all be Zeichet Sitria Samesim I've got here a picture to show you of uh, Cecile's mother, which she sent me earlier on. And I've got here a few words, just, just something to tell you a little bit about her. She was a remarkable woman. She lived a brave and resilient life dedicated to faith and to family. She was a Holocaust survivor who immigrated with her husband Irving to the United States in 1950. Despite experiencing the most inconceivable horrors and painful tragedies and terrible losses, Anna rose from the ashes to rebuild her life in New York City, devoted to family, to home, to Jewish values, and of course, she was a businesswoman. Anna Markheim was born in Krakow, in Poland, and she was born on July the 23rd, 1923, to a large, loving, and comfortable family. She was the third of five children. When the war broke out in 1939, she was a teenager. She had been in the gymnasium, the high school. She took art lessons. She read Anna Karenina. And she went to the cinema with her older sister and with her father. But that idyllic childhood was going to change forever as a result of the outbreak of World War II. In 1941, Anna and her family were forced to leave their home in Krakow and they resettled in the Podgorzy ghetto. In 1942, Anna and her mother were sent to Plashov work camp. In 1943, together with her mother, they were both transported to the horror camp Birkenau, Auschwitz. Together with her mother, they were directed to a sorting line, that horrible, infamous sorting line as you arrived in Auschwitz-Birkenau. Despite the dehumanizing circumstances and the extreme stress of the situation, Anna began to observe the difference between those people at the head of the line who were being directed to the right and those who were being directed to the left. She realized that the young and old were directed to go in one direction, but the able-bodied were directed to go in the other direction. She realized that one direction meant certain death and that the other meant a chance for life. Her mother was in line in front of her. When they got to the head of the line, to Anna's horror, Dr. Josef Mengele, that horrific Nazi war criminal, he was the officer in charge, directed her mother, who was a middle-aged woman, to go into the line that meant certain death. 
Just then, Anna, who hadn't formally learnt German as a language, found herself calling out in perfect Hochdeutsch. Herr Kommandant, schauen Sie diese Frau an. Sie ist jung und kann noch arbeiten. That's what she said. Commander, please look at this woman. She's still young. She can still work. The SS officers at his side lifted their guns to shoot her. But at that moment, Anna made eye contact with that horrific Malacha Mobis, Josef Mengele, the angel of death. He told the officers to hold their fire. He walked up to Anna and looked at her and her mother after what seemed like an incredibly long time, but probably only a few seconds. He motioned for both Anna and her mother to go into the line that gave them a chance for life, not to go to the gas chambers. In the camp, Anna was fortunate enough to get a job in the kitchen, which meant she had more of a chance to survive. She constantly put herself in danger by smuggling out potatoes or bread, any extra morsel of food, bringing them to her barracks to give to her mother and to a band of close friends. In 1945, tragically, and only weeks before the liberation, her mother Cecilia died of typhus in Bergen-Belsen. Cecile, who's the author of these words that I'm reading right now, tells me that her mother never completely recovered from losing her own mother after having struggled for so many years, so in such difficult circumstances, to keep her alive. She, that is, Anna and her younger brother Romek, survived the Holocaust. The story about Mengele and Auschwitz is an example of Anna's many extraordinary qualities that helped her survive. She had intelligence, she had courage, she had empathy, she had inner strength, and she had incredible amounts of determination. Some vignettes here just to show Anna's other positive qualities. She was known for her delicious Jewish cooking, and that's of course one of the reasons I regret not having met her. No one left her generous table without, at the very least, a portion of seconds. And of course, you had to leave room for tea and dessert, home-baked pies and cakes. She cooked and baked with love, and it was always evident in all the meals that she prepared. Everything was made from scratch, with the season's bounty, with the highest quality and with the freshest ingredients. She was the original farm-to-table cook before the food revolution of Alice Water in 1971 and her local market cooking. Anna poured love, her love and care to her family into the authentic homemade food that they enjoyed at home daily and on Shabbos and Yom Tovim, the food that they all loved, that's what she made. And as in most Jewish families, everything of importance always happened around meal times, and the meal times were such a perfect time for those things to happen because the food was so good. In most ways Anna was old-fashioned but however in a few ways she was fairly ahead of her time. She was an unwitting feminist. She strongly felt that a woman should be financially independent and have a source of her own money also known as apparently a knipple. It's a new word on me but Cecile assures me that it's a real word. My mother says Cecile, often told me that a woman, a wife, should always have her own money to spend as she wished, her private knipple. She was horrified when she was told that Cecile didn't have her own account when she got married to Ed. Ed, you see that? That's, what it's, that's it. It's it all out in public now. No secrets. Anna was 96 years old when she died. And she was a fighter to her last breath. She had four children, she had seven grandchildren and two great-grandchildren when she died. And there's so much to share about her. And she was a complicated but compelling woman. She had a strong personality. Unfortunately, we don't have time for more, but hopefully we will hear more about her in, on the yard sites in the years ahead from Cecile. And I want to wish Cecile and her sisters, both of them, one in Holland, one here in Los Angeles, that they should have a chaim aruchim, a long life, like their mother, a wonderful life, 
and that we should be zeicha to meet your mother again when Tchias HaMesim happens. Ad Bias Hagoya. Let's begin the shir. And forgive me, I'm not sure which camera I'm looking at because we've got Zoom, I've got the camera which is filming this. So forgive me if I'm not quite focusing on you when I'm talking. I'm trying my best to keep everyone involved. Um, Carly, if you can please post the source sheet on the comment section in the Zoom. The source sheet will also be available on the YouTube. It will be available on the SoundCloud. It will be available on my website. So you're going to have multiple options to be able to download the PDF of the source sheet. But we're going to be talking today, the subject that we're going to be discussing in this Shabbat Shubha Drosha is whether or not high holidays, Yomim Noraim, are indeed sad times. Yomim Noraim means days of awe, awesome days. Are they a sad time? Are we meant to be sad? Are we meant to be very serious? Or are they Chagim? Are we meant to be happy? What is the, what is the correct state of mind when it comes to Yamim Noraim. And in the course of this year, we're going to talk about various aspects of Yamim Noraim and explore them so that we can truly understand what is expected of us during the high holidays. First of all, why do we fast on Yom Kippur? It's an important question, right? We're not going to eat for 25 hours. Let's at least know why that should be the case. If it's important to fast on Yom Kippur, surely we should also fast on Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is part of Yamim Noraim. It's a Chag. So why don't we fast on Rosh Hashanah? Indeed, I'm, a, I'm giving a Shabbos Shuvah Rosh I know it's not Shabbos Shuvah right now, but shouldn't we also fast on Shabbos Shuvah if it's such an important day? Maybe we should be fasting the whole of Aser Esimei to Shuvah from beginning to end. And just eat in the night, I don't know, come up with some formula, sort of Jewish Ramadan. I've got no idea. But why are we only fasting on Yom Kippur if it's so important to fast? Why is any Yom Tov a happy day? Have you ever thought about that? What compels us to be happy on Yom Tov? We're going to talk about that during this year as well. And what does happiness mean in practical terms? We're going to try and find, we're going to try and coax out of the sources some understanding, some level of understanding as to what it means for a Jew, a person of faith, to be happy. And the first, uh, sorry, the last question is can we fast and be happy at the same time? Because that's what we're going to be doing on Yom Kippur, fast. Does that mean that we can't be happy? Does one exclude the other. So let's look at the first source. If you have your source sheet in front of you, the first source is a Gemara from Rosh Hashanah. Meseches Rosh Hashanah. It's Daf Yud Ches Omed Beis. And we're also going to see what the Beis Yosef, who is the author of the Shulchan Aruch, had to say about this Gemara. Now, what is the day that we fast to commemorate the death the murder, the assassination of Gedalia ben Achikam, who was the leader of the Jewish people in the immediate period after the destruction of the Beis Amikdash of the first temple. What's the day that we fast? Everybody knows. It's called Tzayim Gedalia. What do we, when is Tzayim Gedalia? Is it on the first of Tishrei? No. Is it on the second of Tishrei? That's the second day of Rosh Hashanah? No. Is it on the third of Tishrei? Yes. So we don't fast on Rosh Hashanah. We fast on the 3rd of Tishrei. Why do we fast? We fast in commemoration. It's the anniversary. It is the day on which, apparently, Mr. Gedalia ben Achikam, the leader of the Jewish people, was assassinated by a, tr some, a troublemaker, by somebody who wanted to create havoc and chaos. Is it the anniversary? Let's see what the Gemara says. Meseches Rosh Hashanah, Daf Yud Ches Omed Beis. Tsoim Hashavii, the seventh fast. Zegimul Betishri, it's on the third of Tishri. Sheboinera Gedalia ben Achikam, because that was the day on which Gedalia ben Achikam was murdered. Seems quite unequivocal. Doesn't seem to leave much room for debate. Kosav Rabbeinu Yeruchim says 
the Shulchan Aruch, the Rabbeinu Yerucham, one of the very early scholars who looked at the Talmud and commented on it, corrected it, finessed it. Rabbeinu Yerucham, do you know what he says, says the Beis Yosef? Barosh Hashan on Neherag. Actually, Gedalia wasn't killed on the 3rd of Tishrei, the day after Rosh Hashanah. He was killed on Rosh Hashanah. The Nidche Ta'anisai Le'yoyim Chayil. But we're not permitted to fast on a Yom Tov. Why? We're going to talk about that. So as a result of not being allowed to fast on Yom Tov, the Ta'anis, the fast that is there to commemorate the assassination of Gedalia bin Achikam, was pushed off on to the third day of Tishrei. What is that telling us? What is the message that is contained in that statement of the Beis Yosef? That Rosh Hashanah, even though it's part of Yomim Noiraim, days of awe, is not a day that you're allowed to fast. You're not allowed to fast on Rosh Hashanah. One second, but we do fast on Yom Kippur. We'll get to that. But you can see that you're not allowed to fast on Rosh Hashanah, even though it would have been correct to fast on Rosh Hashanah because the true anniversary of the death of Gedalia was Rosh Hashanah. It's pushed off onto a weekday, the day after Yom Tov. Let's look at the Psukim. This is source number two. I'm not going to read through all the Psukim. I haven't translated them. This is the Parsha in Vayikra. It's in Emoir, which discusses all the different festivals that we have that we commemorate throughout the year, and that includes Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. I'm going to read you some of the words. I've bolded some of the words that are reproduced here in the source sheet. So the first thing is to introduce the festivals. The Pasuk says these are the festivals. These are the special times of year that have been appointed, that have been chosen by God to be festivals during the Jew Jewish calendar year. If you're a person of faith, this is the time when you celebrate a Chag. Okay? The word Moyed, even though it means time, it's translated as a festival. So included in that is, um, we have that on the first day of the seventh month, it becomes a Yom Tov. The first day of the seventh month is what? Rosh Hashanah. It's included among the list of festivals that is in Parshas Emmer in Vayikra. So, and then we have um, that we have Mikra Kodesh on the 10th. Ach be'osel ha'kodesh ha'shvi a yom ha'kippurim hu is also a festival. So there, there's an addition which says that you have to somehow afflict your nefesh, that nevertheless it is to be considered one of the festive days of the calendar year. Then we have Chakasukhoi, seven days, And it continues, Seven days that we have of the festival of Sukkot, Chag Lashem Shebas Yomim, and then we have the posik that we use for the Kiddush on Yom Tov, Vayedabe Moshe Esmoyad De Hashem of Bnei Yisrael. So the word Moyed and Mikroye Kodesh is associated with Sukkot, which we know to be a festival. It's a seven-day festival. And it's also associated with Rosh Hashanah. And it's also associated with Yom Kippur. What is the message that's being conveyed here by the Torah, by the very source and the foundation and the platform for the Jewish faith, that Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are synonymous with, with Sukkot? What does that mean? That they are to be considered festivals. They are happy days. What do we say about Sukkot? We say, We say, you must be happy on Sukkot. Well, if you've got to be happy on Sukkot, then you should be happy as well on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. How do we square that with the fact that the Pesach says, How do we square that with the fact that both Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are very serious days on which are decided the future, not only of our own lives, but of the lives of everybody alive? How do we understand that on those days that we, we are meant to be happy? 
that we have to be v'samachta b'chagechov ha'yisa ach sameach. Let's look at a Gemara. This is source number three, a Gemara in Erechin. The Gemara in Erechin, Daf Yud Omid Beis, has a very important question. I'm going to read you. I've got the Hebrew here, Aramaic, but I'm going to read you the translation that I've put together here for you. Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are called in the Posuk, says the Gemara, Moyed. What does Moyed mean? We've just discussed it. Moyed means Yom Tov, Chag. They are sanctified. How are they sanctified, says the Gemara? They have a prohibition against doing any kind of work, any kind of malacha on those days. Surely, if that's the case, if Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are Moyed, and you're not allowed to do any melacha on those days. They're like Yom Tov, they're like Shabbos, but certainly like Yom Tov to the extent, what do we do on Yom Tov? What do we do on Pesach? What do we do on Shavuos? And what do we do on Sukkot in the davening? We say, Hallel. Surely, asks the Gemara in Erechin, Daf Yud Amad Beis, we should say Hallel on Rosh Hashanah. Now, I'm not sure if everybody watching this was in shul this year, but I'm sure you davened. And if you davened, you had the machzah in front of you. Is there halel on Rosh Hashanah? I know I can't hear the answer, but you're all shouting at the screen and you're saying, Rabbi Dana, there's no halel on Rosh Hashanah. Really? Why is there no halel on Rosh Hashanah? It's a moed. You're not allowed to do malacha. It's a yom tov. Why didn't we say halel on Rosh Hashanah? Have you ever thought of that question? Don't worry if you didn't, because the Gemara did. The Gemara asked the question, what is Hallel? Hallel is an expression of our joy, our simcha on Yom Tov, And we say praises to Hashem. And we sing Hallel on Yom Tov because we're so happy. Now, if Rosh Hashanah is a moed, which we just said, we saw it in the Torah, says the Gemara, why don't we say Hallel on Rosh Hashanah? What about Yom Kippur? <laughs> Yom Kippur is a sad day. It's a dep- No, what are you talking about? It was included in Parshas Emmer as one of the Mayadim. It's one of the Mayads. It's one of the Yomim Toivim. Surely we should say Halal on Yom Kippur. Do we say Halal on Yom Kippur? I know you're all answering at once. No, we never say Halal on Yom Kippur. How come we don't say Halal on Yom Kippur? That's the question the Gemara asks. Answers the Gemara. Mishum de Rabbi Avo. In the name of Rabbi Avo, this is the answer. Rabbi Avo said, that the Malachi Ashores, the ministering angel, said to Hashem, Master of the universe, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Rebbeinu Shalolam, why does the nation of Israel not sing Hallel before you on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur? This is what Rabbi Avohu said, that I guess in some tradition that he had, some Torah Shabbat pair, that the angels in Shomayim in heaven asked God, why don't we say Hallel on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur? To which Hashem answered, Omar Lohen, Ef Shemelech Yoshev Akisi Adin, the Sifrei Chaim, the Sifrei Mason, Besuchim Lefono. Is it possible, does it make any sense that when the king sits on the throne of judgment and the books of the living and the books of the dead are open in front of him? Be Yisrael Oimrim Shira Lefonai? And the Jewish nation should sing Hallel in front of me? Does that make any sense? How does it make sense? There's a tension here. Of course Rosh Hashanah is a Yom Tov. And of course Yom Kippur is a Yom Tov. But there's a tension because there's another side to the coin. And the other side to the coin is that on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, you're being judged for the coming year. How does it make sense to sing a song if you're going to be judged for the coming year. But what's the implication of the Gemara? The implication of the Gemara is that Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are happy days. They are days of simcha, days of joy. They are ma'adim in the same way as Pesach and Shavuos and Sukkot. They may have a different edge to them, but nevertheless, they are happy days. Let's look at the Rambam. The Rambam in Hilchas Chanukah, in Peri Gimel, Halacha Vav says as follows: Avol Rosh Hashanah v'Yom Kippur and Eimbahim Halal l'Fishahem Yemei Teshuva. He gives a sound basis for the fact that we don't say Halal 
on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. He says because they are days of Teshuvah. And it doesn't make any sense. It's a contradiction in terms for one to say Hallel on a day which is considered one of the Yemei Teshuvah, the days of Teshuvah. Teshuvah and Yira, he says. Upachad and fear. Lo Yemei Simcha Yaseira. They are not considered to be days of excessive joy. By the way, what does that mean? If you're somebody who likes to be medayek on a Rambam, he doesn't say that they are lo yemei simcha, period. He says <coughs> that they are lo yemei simcha yaseira. They are not days of excessive joy. They are joyful days. Rosh Hashanah is a happy day. Yom Kippur is a happy day, but not excessive happiness. That's the Rambam's explanation as to why we don't say Hallel. He concedes the fact that as a Moyed, Rosh Hashanah is a happy day, but it's not a day of Simcha Yaseira. He concedes the fact that Yom Kippur is a happy day, but it's not a day of Simcha Yaseira. That being the case, we don't say Hallel. Now we have Gomorrah in Tanis. You ready for this Gomorrah? It's fascinating. This Gemara is going to tell you something about Yom Kippur that you never thought that you would hear. Okay? Listen carefully. The Gemara says in Tanis, that Yom Kippur is in fact one of the most joyous days of the year. Really? Are you going to be joyful on Yom Kippur? Think about it. This is what the Gemara says. Omar Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel. Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel said as follows. There were no happier days of the Jewish calendar year than the 15th of Av and Yom Kippur. We're not going to talk about the 15th of Av right now, but Yom Kippur. Happiest day of the year. Really? Why? Shebahen Benois Yerushalayim on that day, the daughters of Jerusalem, Yoitzeis Bichli Lavan, Shaulin, Shaloi Lebayesh, Esmi, She'ein Loi. It was on that day that the daughters of Jerusalem, the girls, the single girls, the debutantes, would come out dressed in beautiful white clothes, all borrowed from each other, that should, nobody should be embarrassed because they didn't have their own. And everybody used to come out. It was a Shidduch day. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine I announced the dating day of the Jewish calendar year is Yom Kippur? Unbelievable. But that's what the Gemara says in Tanis. The Gemara says it was one of the happiest days of the Jewish calendar year. It was the day that the Benois Yerushalayim would dress in their finest clothes. Not theirs. They would borrow the finest clothes from their friends and go out. And I guess there would be some mixing and mingling. Heaven forfend. And that was the happy day of the year because by the end of Yom Kippur, they would have met somebody who would potentially turn out to be their future husband. Can you imagine we announced on Yom Kippur that in our shul, a Beverly Hills synagogue, we're having a speed dating event. Can you imagine such a thing? It would be unbelievable. I think that, uh, you know, the secular Jews might laugh at us a bit more. Can you believe such a thing? But the Gomorrah says it. The Gomorrah says that on Yom Kippur, they would do this. They would dress in their finest clothes and it was a happy day of the year. So how are, we to, how are we to understand this aspect of Yom Kippur as expressed to us in the Gemara? I'm going to read to you a Rosh, a Rabbeinu Osher. The Rabbeinu Osher says, with regard to the matter of fasting on the two festival days of Rosh Hashanah, should we fast on Rosh Hashanah or not? And on Shabbos Shuvah, are we meant to be fasting? Asks the Rosh. I am partial, he says. To the words of Rav Hai Gon, who writes that it is better not to fast. Why? As this is what the first leaders of Israel said to the Israelites, to the Jewish nation. On Rosh Hashanah, it's in Nehemia. We're going to read the actual source in Tanakh in a moment. But the Gemara, sorry, the Rosh quotes it. It says, eat fatty foods, drink sweet drinks, for today is a sacred day. How is it possible that we could fast on a day when the great Leaders of Israel told the Jewish nation that they should eat and drink and be merry. Similarly with Shabbos Shuvah, it isn't appropriate for someone to fast on Shabbos Shuvah. Why? 
because on Tisha B'Av, if it falls on a Shabbos, we push it off to Sunday. And therefore, even though on Shabbos Shuvah, you might think you should fast, and it doesn't make any sense. Shabbos is a happy day. Shabbos is a happy day. Rosh Hashanah, two happy days. You don't fast on Rosh Hashanah. I want to read you the sources. It's in source number seven, of, uh, and it's in Nehemia. A description of what happened when the leaders of the Jewish nation returned to Eretz Yisrael from Bavel, Ezra and Nehemiah. And the Psukim say that it was Rosh Hashanah. It was on the first day of the seventh month. Look it up. I, I challenge you to look it up. It's on the, in the eighth chapter of Nehemiah. It's a fascinating story. It was on the first day of the seventh month. It was on Rosh Hashanah. And they brought out a Sefer Torah and they read from the Sefer Torah and nobody had heard of Rosh Hashanah. I know you're thinking to yourself, how is that possible? Jewish people living in Eretz Yisrael have never heard of Rosh Hashanah. I want to tell you something. It's very easy in two or three generations to forget what it means to be a Jew. If you don't believe me, I'll tell you that I went to Russia in 1990. I went to Russia and I met Jews whose grandparents learnt in Slabodki Yeshiva and whose grandparents learnt in Navaradik Yeshiva and they spoke Yiddish but they'd never heard of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur they had never heard of Sukkot they had never heard of anything to do with the Jewish faith they'd never seen a pair of tefillin they'd never seen tzitzis it's possible in two or three generations to forget everything Ezra and Nehemiah returned from Babel and the Jews who'd been left behind were the simplest people possible, of the lowest class, the working class of the Jewish nation. And they had completely forgotten about Rosh Hashanah, and Ezra and Nehemiah took out a Sefer Torah, and they read from the Sefer Torah. And they read that on the first day of the seventh month of the Jewish calendar year, it's a very holy day. It's a Mayed. Mikrae Kodesh. So that's what they're reading from the Torah and the people are standing there and saying, really? Is that true? And it was that day. It was Rosh Hashanah. What happened? Nehemiah and Ezra, they said to the Jewish nation, this day is holy. Hashem wants you to be happy on this day. You mustn't mourn. You mustn't weep. They heard the words of Torah and they became depressed about how ignorant they were. Don't cry, said Ezra. Don't weep, said Nehemiah. Today is a happy day. It's Rosh Hashanah. Go and eat fatty food. Ichlu mashmanim ushesumam takim. And drink sweet drinks. And you know what else? For Shilchu Monais and send gifts of food to those people who don't have any food. Do you know why? Today is a holy day. You're not allowed to be depressed on this day. For the joy of God is your true strength. Rosh Hashanah. Says the Rosh, quoting this piece from chapter 8 in Nehemiah, is a happy day. It may be one of the days of awe, maybe one of the Yomim Narayim, but it is a happy day. Okay, we don't say Hallel because it's Yemei Teshuva, as the Rambam tells us. But it is a happy day. It's a day of joy. And the, and the Rosh continues about Rosh Hashanah being a happy day. But Shuvah is Marsha Sholem, he says. I saw it written, They used to daven. This is when the formula for davening was first created. And he said, Do you know what they say? They say, On Rosh Hashanah, Mayadim le Simcha. Mayadim le Simcha for joy on Rosh Hashanah. Chagim uzmanim le Sosain. Es yoim azikorin hazeh. It's a time of Simcha. It's a time of Sosa in Rosh Hashanah. Sharei Kosov Elemoy Adei Hashem, because the Possek says in Vayikra and Emoy, these are the joyful days of God. Bereshin Yonah, that's what Yom Tov is all about. Ubesoif, Min Yonah, Vadaba Moshe, Esmoy Adei Hashem, the Possek says, Moy Adei Hashem, these are the chosen times of God, these are the joyful times of the Jewish calendar year. 
And what is it talking about? Pesach Vatzeres, Rosh Hashanah, the Yom Kippur, the Sukkot, the Shmini Atzeres. Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is included in the count of the happy days. Each one of them is compared, they're in the same basket. These are the joyful days of God. Asks the Rosh, how do we know that Rosh Hashanah is considered to be one of the festivals? Because it says, what's the words? We say for the, we say it on Mariv, on Rosh Hashanah and Mariv, we say, Keser le yoim chagenu. Chagenu, it is our festival. Uminayin shenikro simcha. How do we know that it should be joyful? Shenema ba yoim simchaschem uminayadechem avroshech ochechem. It's a day of joy. There's a scriptural proof for the fact that Rosh Hashanah is a joyful day. But Omar Mar, Sukkah Nun Hei, and we say in Meseches Sukkah Daf Nun Hei, Chodshechem Ketzad. What does it mean, Chodshechem? Does it just mean the first day of any month? We're talking about Ze Rosh Hashanah. We're talking about Rosh Hashanah is the day of joy. The Gamba say for Ezra Motzino, and he quotes Ezra where it says, Ki You mustn't be depressed on Rosh Hashanah. It's a happy day. Change your frame of mind. Change your frame of reference. Yomim Noroim have an aspect of Yomei Teshuva, but nevertheless, they are happy days. They are days of joy, days of happiness. And the Sefi Yireim, he has a very interesting point. He says, you know something? Yom Kippur is a happy day. So how come we fast? How is it possible? Simchas. Simcha b'chagam ha matzah for Rosh Hashanah like Sif. It doesn't actually use the word simcha about, uh, about uh, Pesach. It doesn't use the word simcha about Rosh Hashanah. So how do we know we have to be happy? Minolam. Mehekish de Rabbi Yoyna, Rabbi Yoyna b'Shavuos, he says as follows, Eile tasu l'Hashem b'mayadeichem. Om Rabbi Yoyna, hukshu kol ha-moyede zelo zeh. There is a comparative, um, we make an analysis of the psukim using comparative texts, parallel texts, and the word that of simcha is used by one, and therefore we use it for all of them. How come then we fast on Yom Kippur? It's a joyful day. And on a simcha, a day of simcha, that we shouldn't be fasting. It doesn't, in and of itself, it is outside of the realms of simcha. Why? Because the Torah specifically said, even though it is a chag, you must fast. But do you know what that's telling you? That if the Torah hadn't told you to fast on Yom Kippur, you'd have to eat on Yom Kippur. And you'd have to be happy on Yom Kippur. Because Yom Kippur is a happy day. Yom Kippur is not a day of sadness. It may be a day of awesomeness, but it's not a day of sadness. It's a day of joy. And we have to be told not to eat because otherwise we would be compelled to eat. We would have to eat. The Gemara in Tanis, the Flamadom at base, actually says that Yom Kippur is a happy day. It says in the Mishnah, this is the Gemara, Rabban Shima Megamliel said, there were no days as happy for the Jewish people as the 15th of Av and Yom Kippur. And the Gemara asks, now it makes sense that Yom Kippur is a day of joy, but because it includes Slicha or Mechila. But what about the 15th of Av? Can you imagine that? The Gemara asks a question saying, it makes sense that Yom Kippur is happy because on Yom Kippur we're going to be davening to Hashem. We're going to say, Avinu malkeinu, alchet shechatonu lefonecha, ashamnu, bagandu, gozalnu. We want to be uchashuba, tfila, utztoka, mavir, and israel, gzera. We're going to daven to Hashem and we're going to get forgiven for our sins. We're going to be penant. We're going to get penance for our sins. It's, it's a happy, a happy day. day. But what about the 15th of Av? I told you I'm not speaking about the 15th of Av today. That's another question. But the Gemara says Yom Kippur is a happy day. The only reason we, do, we fast on Yom Kippur is because we're forced to fast because the Torah said it. But had the Torah not said it, we would never fast on Yom Kippur because it's a Chag. It's a Maid. It's a Yom Tov. 
the Mishnah Brua, the Chofetz Chaim writing in the Mishnah Brua, says as follows: Mechapsin mistaprim be'erv Hashanah. You must um, wash yourself. You must have a haircut on erev Rosh Hashanah. Laharay she'onu betuchin bechasto yisparach. Why do we do that? Surely it should be like a day of mourning. No, says the Chofetz Chaim. Day of mourning? What are you talking about? How can you call it a day of mourning? It's a day of the great kindnesses and benevolence and munificence of God. But Tuchin Bachastoi, we utterly believe and have faith in his generosity of spirit. That he's going to judge us favorably. How can we be judged favorably if we didn't have a haircut and we don't wash ourselves? In anticipation of that great moment, we must prepare ourselves properly. Don't dress in the nicest clothes, says the Chofetz Chaim, on Rosh Hashanah like you would do in every other Yom Tov. So that you should have some level of anticipation of fear for the judgment that will be pronounced on Rosh Hashanah. You should dress in beautiful white clothes. That's why I come from a yeki background in Rosh Hashanah. We wear a kittel. I know that in many other communities they don't wear a kittel on Rosh Hashanah. We wear a kittel. We come from the German background. I have history in my family of a thousand years in Germany, descendants from Rashi. We wear a talus that's completely white. We wear a kittel. We wear a white yarmulke. This, and the Mishra says the same thing. I don't know what the Chofetz Chaim was. That's an interesting question. I wish I could have some evidence that the Chofetz Chaim did the same as I do on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, that he wore a white yarmulke and he wore a white a kittel, obviously, and a white talus. That would have been a remarkable thing to have seen. But that's what he says. Wear nice white clothes on Rosh Hashanah. And let's look, I'm going to look at the final piece, which I think is absolutely beautiful. It's number 12 on your source sheet, and with that, we're going to end today. Mitzvah lechol be'erb yom ha-kippurim v'lehar bo'is besudo. So the Shulchan Aruch tells us, and by the way, it's based on a Gemara, and it's based, actually, it's Torah Baal Peh, based on a source in scripture in the Pasuk. It's a mitzvah to eat on erb yom kippah, and to eat not just one meal, but two. And in fact, I come from a tradition we used to have a full su'uda in the morning and a full su'uda in the afternoon. That means at lunchtime, before lunchtime, 11 o'clock or whatever it is, we had a proper su'uda, a meat fleshik su'uda. And again, before um, the final su'uda, before Yom Kippur, we also would have a proper su'uda. Not just a snack, not just a bit of a meal and a sandwich, but a proper su'uda where we sat in Shabbos clothes and we ate properly. That's based on this, that the Shulchan Aruch says in Arachayim Tafresh Dalet, Halach Alef, that on Erev Yom Kippur you have to eat a lot and you have to eat su'udois. You have to eat festive meals. You should know. This is the only day of the Jewish calendar year that we have an actual mitzvah to eat, to actually eat all day long. You should know that on the first night of Pesach, we have a mitzvah to eat matzah, a gazais of matzah. What's a gazais? An olive volume of matzah. And on the first night of Sukkot, we have a mitzvah to eat bread, a gazais volume of bread, in the sukkah. We don't have a mitzvah to eat enough matzah that we are satisfied, or enough bread in the sukkah that we are satisfied. We just have to, once we've eaten that amount that we are obligated to eat, we don't have to exceed that amount. That's enough. And even on Shabbos, and on Yom Tov, there's not a specific mitzvah to eat. The mitzvah is that we should have a satisfying, happy Shabbos, and we should have a satisfying and happy Yom Tov. 
ומכיוון שהעונג והשמחה באים בדרך כלל גם על ידי אכילו שסייה. Since the generally speaking, happiness, joy, satisfaction comes about as a result of eating, that's what we do. On Oichlim Veshoisim, that's what we do on Yom Tov and on Shabbos, because that's going to make you happy. But there's no specific mitzvah to eat. The mitzvah is to be, to have Oinig Shabbos and to have Simchas Yom Tov. Theoretically speaking, if there's somebody out there who doesn't get joy, pleasure out of eating or drinking, you wouldn't have to eat on Shabbos or Yom Tov specifically. Why? Because we don't have any specific obligation to do that. We don't want to make him upset. He's not going to be happy if he does that. There's only one day in the Jewish calendar year where the Torah actually instructs us, commands us and obligates us to eat and to be satisfied. When is this day exactly? On the ninth day of the month of Tishri. Erev Yom Kippurim. It's Erev Yom Kippur. The kol kach gedula chashibus social mitzvah zu. This mitzvah is considered so incredibly important. At shafilu mematim b'talmud Torah b'erev yom kippurim teilech of elishtois. If you're somebody who sits and learns all day, I'm not even going to say present company excluded. I don't know who's listening or watching this video or this uh, SoundCloud. You're somebody who sits and learns from six o'clock in the morning to ten o'clock at night. On erev yom kippur, close the Gemara. Close the safer, go inside the kitchen, open the fridge and eat something. Why? Because that's the mitzvah of the day. The mitzvah of the day is not to learn Torah. Don't be a Torah learner on Erev Yom Kippur, if that's what you do normally. On Erev Yom Kippur, be an eater. Make sure that you eat enough. Amah Ariya Kodosh, the Ariya Kodosh, the Holy Arizal, says as follows. Shabachilo shel Erev Yom Kippurim l'shem shamayim yochel odom l'saken is achilose shokol ha'shona. If you eat on Erev Yom Kippur, L'Shem Shamayim, for the sake of heaven, you can undo anything negative you may have done by eating the wrong food or in the wrong way or without making a brach or whatever it is throughout the calendar year that preceded Erev Yom Kippur. Can you imagine that? Eat properly with a proper brach and with proper kabon on Erev Yom Kippur. You can undo anything negative that you may have done by eating the wrong way the year before. There are those who say whose halachic opinion it is that you need to eat double as much food that you normally eat during the day on every normal day on Erev Yom Kippur. Twice as much food. But this, the kicker is in this final paragraph and then we will leave it. Surely, on Erev Yom Kippur, the appropriate mode of behavior, the way that we should conduct ourselves should be in fear and trepidation. Surely that's what we should be doing on Erev Yom Kippur. What exactly is the place of the joy involved in eating and drinking on this day which comes before the final day of judgment Yom Kippur which is the most serious day of the year by Rabbi Moshe Kordovera one of the holy Kabbalists of Tzfat explained as follows Rabbi Moshe Kordovera says Do you know why we eat? It's in anticipation of the joy of conducting ourselves and involving ourselves in the mitzvah of Teshuvah on Yom Kippur. We are celebrating the mitzvah of Teshuvah. We always celebrate mitzvahs with a Suda, right? We have a bris, we have a Suda. We have a wedding, we have a Suda. Every time we do something, a mitzvah, we have a Suda. What about the mitzvah of Teshuvah? We should have a Suda. Bit of a problem. You're not allowed to eat on Yom Kippur. No problem at all. Erev Yom Kippur becomes the day that we celebrate 
The mitzvah of teshuva, says Rav Moshe Kordavera. I'm not making this up, by the way. This is Rav Moshe Kordavera writing 500 years ago. We have to celebrate the kiyom of every mitzvah. The most, one of the most important mitzvahs in the Torah is the mitzvah of teshuva. Surely we should be celebrating that mitzvah. That makes sense. It's one of the most important mitzvahs. Do you know why? Because through that mitzvah, you're going to wipe clean the slate of any sins that you may have committed. And you're going to once again renew your relationship with God. There's nothing more important than that. It's not a one-off mitzvah, a side mitzvah, a marginal mitzvah. It's a primary mitzvah. It's the mitzvah of Teshuvah. Unfortunately, during the time that you're conducting this mitzvah, that you are involved in doing this mitzvah, in order to do it, you've got to be serious. It's not a time to celebrate and drink, eat and be merry. You're going to be confessing your sins. You're going to be taking upon yourself all types of things for the future. And that moment, it's not appropriate, it doesn't make sense, the awe. It's not possible to be able to celebrate. But, but we have to celebrate, of course we must celebrate. The mitzvah of Tshuva is such an important mitzvah, how are we going to celebrate? We can't do it when we're doing it. So what are we meant to do? Belochein says, the Rav Moshe Kodavera, Therefore, Tzivusah Torah Hashem, Nismach Ba'achil Hashem, Siyah Lepnei Yom HaKippurim. Let us anticipate before Yom Kippur, by, by celebrating, celebrating the mitzvah of Teshuvah even before we've started on it. Can you imagine that? It's amazing. Why? It is in that frame of mind that you go into this holy day. It is the day that we should be joyful because God has given us the opportunity, the chance, the pathway back to Him and to have a relationship with Him and to get close to Him. That joy, by the way, in anticipation of us receiving penance for anything that we may have done wrong, let us celebrate. So we've seen here that Rosh Hashanah is a happy day and we eat and drink. That Aseris made Teshuva are happy days and we eat and drink. The Shabbat Shuvah is a happy day and we eat and drink. Yom Kippur is one of the happiest days of the year. It's Shidduch Day. That's what it says in the Gemara. It's a day when you dress in your finest white clothes. It's a day when you have the perfect opportunity to reconnect with God. Okay, we should be celebrating it's a happy day. Well, we can't because it says in the Torah, No problem. We're not going to celebrate on that day, even though it's a happy day. It's hovering in the background. It's there as a backdrop to the day that it's a happy day. But during the day, we need to focus on being serious. Therefore, we're not going to be laughing and, and eating and drinking and doing those things. But we have a day that we do it in double. Kiflayim. When is that day? Erev Yom Kippur. Where we eat enough for Erev Yom Kippur and for Yom Kippur. And then when after Yom Kippur is over, we can dance and sing. And we have the happiest festival of the Jewish calendar year. We have the festival of Sukkos. I want to bless you all. And please bless me back. That this year we should have the happiest Yom Kippur ever. And following that, the happiest Sukkos ever. And the happiest year ever. That we should have the most wonderful year full of joy, full of simcha, full of rinoft, full of gila. We have so many words in Hebrew for happiness. Full of health and full of nachas and full of everything that we need in order to get us back to where we need to be, both in terms of our human lives and in terms of our relationship with God. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for being with me. Gemar chasimotayma.